things. One is, I was just asked to say a few words about how this project came to be. And um, I think I mentioned yesterday that um, there's been a long-standing partnership uh, between the Department of Media Arts in, uh, at Highlands and the Department of Cultural Affairs, the idea about preparing students for careers as multimedia specialists. And um, so that has had ma many kind of tentacles that have gone out into the world. And, uh, and that ended up with Highlands, that department being invited in a sense to, um, to apply to the Mellon Foundation for uh, funding for this idea that they, uh, this is not the only cultural heritage, <coughs> cultural heritage project that Mellon has funded um, nationally. So they are just obviously interested in this idea of what, what this could be uh, a catalyst for. Um, and uh, so the, the Mellon grant is really what spurred this on. How it turned into the region and Manitos was because our project director is Esteban Rael Galvez. Uh, so he's from uh, that area, Cuesta-ish. And, um, and he thought it would uh, be a good kind of area to focus on, rather than do the whole state of New Mexico to focus on an area where, A, he was very familiar with it, but also, as we discussed yesterday, has this kind of coherent uh, culture uh, you know, clearly defined, it just seemed like a good focus for a cultural heritage, coherent cultural heritage archive as opposed to, um, and also one that's been underrepresented. So uh, I think the feeling being that the tribes have done, uh, had more opportunity or done more than the Indo-Hispano uh, community. So there were a lot of factors that went into the idea, first of all, that we do it at all, and then second of all, of the, our sort of geographic focus which has turned into more of a cultural focus because of this phenomenon um, that I brought up yesterday where via social media, local villages are connecting to, um, to their diasporas, what we're calling their diasporas, but people who, who uh, you know, and here's an area that has really suffered from depopulation. And so we're very excited about the potential of that idea of reconnecting um, in a virtual community, what that might mean um, for for the culture. So, um, did that answer? Does that, is that enough of an answer for people? I hope. If you have more questions, um, I'm yeah. Um, I understand why you picked what you did for this particular one. Um, <coughs> is there thought about when this one is somewhat complete of maybe starting it in other areas in New Mexico for other? Uh, groups or whatever? So, really good question. I think part of what our, we need to be thinking about as a community is creating a model that's replicable, right? Because, and adaptable by other communities that, um, so one of the other communities that uh, is, uh, was, you know, sort of connected to through the History Pen Connection is Louisiana, and it's a sharecropper, you know, people descended in from sharecropper communities. So um, so what we can learn from each other, you know, it's kind of transferable skill set, right? What we're, what we're doing. Um, so I would say more than, you know, this expanding into other, uh, you know, geographic areas or other cultures, it would be use our model maybe more. But I, I think that is one of the things that the funders always are happy to see happen, right? Is that you've created a model that's sustainable, that's adaptable, that's replicable, and, and all that. So I, it's something to keep in our minds, you know, that we want to make this accessible to other people, other communities, and support, you know, support that kind of thing. So the Mellon Grant, unfortunately, the end of this year, um, I think we have delivered so much more than they expected, uh, or had a right to expect, based on, um, you know, what we proposed. They, they tend to continue uh, supporting projects uh, long term. They're kind of a good partner in that way. Um, but there will be a gap because you have to turn in your final report and they have to invite you again. They're very, um, so I asked at one point like, well, will they come on a field, you know, come out here? Because they don't kind of get us. And, 
And uh, somebody said, no, no, they never come out of those offices in Manhattan. They're, you have to like pilgrimage up the elevator, you know, to meet with your program officer. We've never met in person, you know, our program officer. So they're, they're kind of old school in, in that certain kinds of ways. And in other ways, they really have, I, I feel like they're sincere in their commitment to this kind of uh, community-based work. So, but we're definitely like the culture of, you know, the, they're used to funding university pro scholarship and that kind of thing. This is kind of new direction for them in a way. So, um, so we're not, I feel like we're a little bit like this, but, um, but nevertheless, in terms of what this community has been able to come together, relationship build, create, co-create, um, that I think they're going to be really happy when, when we report out on it. And so our expectation is that they would continue to fund, but as I said, there's going to be a gap in there where we're going to have to uh, be scrappy. Any other thoughts, questions about that? Only other thing, we have a visitor in the back of the room, Nathan King. A lot of you read the article that he wrote in the Rio Grande Sun. He's doing a follow-up piece. He will probably want to interview some of you if you are willing. And I don't know if you're taking pictures or what all, but anyway, that's Nathan. And he did a beautiful write-up for us, um, which we got a lot of positive feedback uh, on. So he is on the story. And uh, with that, I don't know who's, who's next here. Fred, you? Okay, back to Mark. Buffalo soldiers, but none of them were buffalo soldiers. 
And so looking up either one of those words didn't yield a, a tag that I could use for the fictional thing that I was going to put in. Exactly, right? So and and so on the one hand, we're forced with wrestling with and reckoning and reckoning these um, archival silences and erasures, right? Of like, well, what happens when you're not seen in archives? And then even as community members that are kind of engaging that and resisting it, we're using these systems, these structures, right? Um, and Foucault talks a lot about that. Um, so now we're, we're kind of some, we're, we hit this other wall of like, okay, so now what, right? We, we want to look up Buffalo Soldiers. It, it's not a Library of Congress term. Even if we separate it out, it doesn't give us the terms that we want, right? <coughs> what else? What else did you guys? I think you mentioned like oh. dialectical differences, language differences. Uh, say, for instance, you you search for, you know, you're looking for uh, a particular uh, local term, and uh, and it has a, a variant spelling. Uh, yeah. Yeah. A lot of times, the Library of Congress uh, uh, identifier will not connect you with anything close to it, or it would just list your word as a misspelled word. Exactly right. So there's these variations, this kind of local knowledge, these variants and, and spelling. And um, I remember too yesterday with uh, Dr. Melendez's introduction, right? He made it a real when he went into his reading. He said, "Oh, this is a New Mexico Spanish." Right, and so even in that one line of you know having to qualify, I think goes back Debbie, to what you're saying about these like variations in language and spelling that, that get omitted from from the Library of Congress. What else? <coughs> so I wanted, so I wanted. Um, this is kind of off the fly because it came up this morning, and I think it's a really good. Um, space to talk about this. Um, this mouse is so Carmen. Do you remember what you were trying to search for? Oh, I I put in Chicano activist. So I think you just said Chicana because I got a whole bunch of laughs at first. You said you put in Chicano activist. Right, and nothing came up. So then you just put in Chicana, and this happened live, right, earlier today, and I heard all of these, like, kind of laughing and giggling, and I thought, okay, well, what's going on? And it automatically said, oh, Chicana, I know what you're thinking about. You must be thinking about Mexican-American lesbians or, or Mexican-American women agricultural workers. Right? And those are the only two drop And those downs. are the only two drop downs in the Library of Congress, right? That we have here. So, what was the Chicana por mi raza all about? I mean, this is pop quiz type. <laughs> the erasure of ourselves. Right? These kinds of erasures of ourselves, of like Chicana feminists, um, working in the civil rights, kind of of their, right? These. Um, act, these women activists that she read, and I think it's so important to have these conversations about how you, how these erasures come up systematically, even within these classification systems. And not only are they erased, but they're filled in. Right? This is what you're really looking for. Right? Why is what? Why is that powerful? Why is that important? Yeah, it doesn't allow people to self-define. Absolutely, right. Number one, it doesn't allow people to self-define. It makes you assimilate. Right, and on the one hand, yeah, absolutely, it makes you assimilate. Well, this is not really what I'm looking for, but I guess I'll pick, you know, pick one of the two, right? There's kind of this process of assimilation. Well, then I'm going to have to fit into one of these categories. Absolutely. What are some other? I think yeah. when we did it yesterday. We, we went to one of the other just categories, and we came up with one that did 
better move that, but I don't remember where it was. Do you remember <laughs> where it was? I, right? These personal a, art, right? Got to find our way back. You've got to, yeah, you've got to look through all of them. Right. You have to, to kind of. That, to see if it comes up in a different place. Oops. Okay, African American women political activists, Indian women, women, women anti part Right, it goes on and on. Women political activists, and United we're not States. There. We're not there. There's no, no category for Mexican American, <laughs> Chicano. Well, maybe we're an offset of something or other, right? <laughs> um, exactly, right? So there's these ways, right, that I think that you're confronted with these systems that. Oftentimes when we're trying to, and we're, we're, we're kind of covering a lot, right? Like digital humanities broadly, the, the, techno, the technical side of Omeka, and then now the subject terms, right? And, but it's all kind of interrelated, and I think it's at least uh, merits a conversation about where do these items fit. Um, any other thing that you guys noticed earlier messing with those? I just have a question. Yeah. I was curious, could you shortcut your research a little bit on this thing by just put, putting in, uh, like, Dolores Huerta, you know, and just... Yeah, and I would, mean, yes. Identify, yes. Then that would take you to the category. I mean, I, I want to I wanna bet that Dolores Huerta has to be in here, right? Maybe she's in the name, right? Um, no, but but it might be in the name, right? So Library of Congress has another section just for like name heading, so like maybe she'd be in there. But that also supposes one knows of Dolores Huerta, right? That means you already know and you're looking for her, so there's some kind of cultural knowledge that we're coming, but in the examples from even yesterday's um, introduction, some of that gets lost. Right, especially with generations, and then what? Um, Buffalo Soldiers, maybe even I would argue, right? Like, yeah. Um, maybe you have to X out of the website, or else add a value, because it, maybe it's combining the two. Maybe of it's them. combining the two. I mean, we're we're really hoping for the best, right? <laughs> like, let's see. Because it did bring up some names when you first did it. Yeah. I mean, I want to say she's in there. She's not populating, but. Those are general subject terms, right? Yes. Um, Amy, save us. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I want to fully acknowledge and, and yeah. everything that you're saying, but I'm also going to be a little contrarian and yeah. say that because it's one of the concerns is that Chicana feminism is being erased, then in a way you want things related to Chicana feminism to pop up in searches about women or feminism in the U.S. or Yeah. With terms, 
it would facilitate the, the accessibility of whatever subject individuals might be interested in right. searching. Yeah, so, and I think this is a good question to pose, right, to your colleagues. Yeah, Shane. So, let's oh. assume that a, 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 you know, a plugin that's developed specifically with many of those search terms for various of these fields, right? Yeah. Is there a distribution network for plugins or I don't know. My so, so there is what's called open source, which means anyone can develop a plugin for it. So it would just be a matter of finding a developer who could write it, and then you could install it, and you could offer it to, you know, you could offer it to anyone who wanted to download it and install it on their Omeka. Yeah. And, and, and I think that these are the beginnings of these kinds of conversations of, you know, that I want to ask you all, what are some of the terms do you think that people looking for this project will be, what are some of the local vocabularies that are important, right? And, and I said, and I said before we went to lunch that I wasn't solving anything, right? I, we're not going to come, but what are some of these vocab, what are some of these local search terms? Those, I mean, there's a lot of people working in communities. What are some of? Manito Hispano. Okay, right. So th the name of the project, right? Manito, a short of, you know, en mano, right? Well, it is it going to show up? Because that has a different, this kind of cultural connotation that's absent from en mano, right? It's not in there. Yeah. It's, it's not, not in there, up. right? So was, absolutely. So that's one. Right? Is the Library of Congress even interested in adding more I, culture? I'm going to get to that okay. in a little bit. Actually, I have this sneak peek of a documentary. <laughs> um, yeah, you had your hand up. Well, you, I don't know if you were asking for the terms, but another yeah. one pop common in Oregon and Mexico. Mayordomo. No? Mayordomo? Yes. Or a yes. 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 And you don't know right. what that word means. Or right. And it's not ditch, right, or waterways. I mean, they, they mean something different in northern New Mexico, right? Yes. So, acequias, mayodormo. Um, Portia, do you, you want to? I was just going to say, I, I might be wrong, but I do believe that the Library of Congress does allow for diacritics and other languages in their proper formats. It is the software that we're using to deliver that information that is not capable. Yeah, of like the diacritic yes. and the Spanish language. We're not going to change it's the totally library of Congress. It's totally <laughs> capable. We'll get to that later. <laughs> yes. But, but yes. we're not going to change the library of Congress. <laughs> right. So we have yeah. to focus yeah. on what we can do. Sorry, Carmen, we're not going to change the library of Congress. Heads up. Yeah. Well, I think it's something so that, well, yeah, we'll get to the most people. Yeah. That thinking about like other fields, right, yeah. or other ways to, to service this information. So it's searchable. So maybe yeah. there's a page or like with some of this glossary or something to then it'll be searchable. So yes. That's just right. Absolutely. And so I think that idea of like a glossary, right, that maybe is like a shared folder, a, a shared page that people can start adding terms and what it means, like a sequia, and, and, and languages that we, that some folks take for granted, but isn't really kind of the language literally or culturally that people speak, right? And so what is the value of like maybe exactly creating a glossary? Um, Another yeah. term, la gente. La gente, yes. And also yeah. nuestro pueblo. Mm -hmm. Both of the, well, no, nuestro pueblo was used a lot in the Spanish language newspapers. Mm -hmm. Yes, in yeah. The, uh, 1900 or thereabouts. That's how people refer to their community. Yeah, yeah. I was going to get the one time. I said, well, what, what's meant by nuestro pueblo? He had a very good, uh, quick answer. He said, well, uh, it's, you've got to look at who is in, who is included in the Nuestro Pueblo and who is excluded, especially the latter, who is excluded, okay? So basically excluded were people not from there. Yes, yeah. They were from the city or they were from someplace else, but not from there, Nuestro Pueblo. Nuestro Pueblo. Sí, and so this, la gente, Nuestro Pueblo, and so Américo Paredes, right, at one point talks really nicely about 
even when you know the literal language, there's these cultural aspects of language that you don't know. So you know what Nuestro Pueblo means, right? But you still have to ask Dr. Melendez, what does this mean, right? So there's always these other cultural levels of language that I think um, come up. That would be useful, I think, for this project and like maybe a glossary or something. Absolutely. Yeah, me. Well, there's even English words, like when we were uh, developing our proposal for Melanie, we used the term historical trauma, mm -hmm. and they said, what is that? Yes. And you can imagine, like, sitting in their high rise in Manhattan, they went, that's legit, right? So we had to explain to them that means right. the experience of displacement, it means loss of knowledge and, and artifacts, and, yeah. um, uh, you know, just what we mean by that term yes. um, yeah. to, to people who, and that's not even no, uh, exactly, exactly. Thank you. I was just going to say, I don't know if we have like a parking lot where we can share info, um, but a colleague of mine just wrote a chapter called Toward a Digital Cultural Rhetoric, mm -hmm. um, and it's in an emerging field called Cultural Rhetorics. And so it's looking at not just the content, but also like the technology development. Like we need yes. more people of color developing like the yeah. tools that we're using. And so it's yes. just very... And yes, right, and, and I think that's something too, and I'm glad that you brought that up because um, in the beginning session, um, listen, I'm all for digital humanities and I'm invested in the benefits and the challenges. Um, and I also um, didn't want to just gloss over like, oh, right? <laughs> like, this is so great because there is, right? And I think it was intentional that I showcased Latinx DH projects, right? And that even in the digital humanities, we're still striving for like diversifying. We need more, you know, diversity and like creating the platforms and the back ends of yeah. technologies and stuff. So yes. And even the language that we use to talk about it, right? So like when you're in the field, people talk about like younger generations being digital natives. Mm -hmm. And so Angela's taking a native rhetorics, you know, yeah. decolonial response to what these terms even mean. Yes. And so then if you're in an older generation who <gasps> didn't grow up with technology but learned it, you're a digital migrant. And I mean, oh I don't know. Yeah. I've never heard that. <laughs> yeah. And so then there's like all this other layering that occurs that as we're having these conversations are like this meta narrative that are a part of it. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I guess another common one is uh, Nuevo Mexicano. Mm -hmm. You know, that was also used in the Spanish language newspapers. And everybody knew what Nuevo Mexicano was. It wasn't the same as in English. Even today, if you say Nuevo Mexicano, you run somebody to somebody in Peñasco or Truchas, you know, they know who you're talking about. They are Nuevo Mexicanos. They're not New Mexicans. You know, New Mexicans is everybody who lives in New Mexico. Yeah, really but Nuevo yeah, Mexicano, yeah, yeah, no. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever heard of Nuestra Raza? Yes. Uh, that's the uh -huh. We're from the same area. Uh -huh. Is that plebe? La plebe. La plebe. I haven't heard of that. La plebe. Oh. Okay. <laughs> but you know, also, yeah. like you said so well, you asked Dr. Melendez, yeah. what does it include? But we also have to ask, what does it not include, or who does it not exclude? Yes. Because right. in yeah. our culture, Northern New Mexico culture, and you know, humanity is what humanity is. And we, our ancestors, we were really good about ostracizing people too, right? I mean, I get it. Yeah, I, so I'm from El Paso, is that New Mexico? Am I a New Mexico? Forget it, right? Like that has all these other implications. But yes, right? Yeah, in Truchas, it's not the hippies. <laughs> you know, right? They're not part of us, no Pueblo. During that period, mm -hmm. there was a large heavy communist in churches and other places, towns. So, and I get, and so why else do these terms matter? So, on the one hand, it matters because, right, we need a way to classify and organize these systems. We need terms, um, direct language that help facilitate these searches. Why, why else can we think that these, you know, the things that pop up and the subjects that we use matter? Okay, yeah, so it, it, these connections, it helps build these, right? And we've been talking about um, these connections across diasporas. Um, and so it helps facilitate that if you have these kind of languages. Um, 
And so, um, so I'm a cultural studies scholar, right? I am, uh, and so without going into a big old talk or lecture on like cultural studies and what that means, right? One thing that cultural studies look at is the formations of ideologies, right? And the way that images um, things from popular culture, the codices and um, census records present, all of these varying things present a certain, a certain image to the world, right? And in so that sense, I would, you know, they argue that even texts present a particular image to the world, right? Even the text, so even these words, right, when we put in Chicana, oh, you must mean Mexican American, right, what does that do to, it not only does it not let us self-identify, it almost identifies you for you, right? And so I think these are really um, important pieces to try to understand of how these not only don't let you define yourself, but also define you, right? And so, um, the in one of the terms that is kind of up for what's I think especially now in today's rhetoric is this idea of um, illegal alien, right? And so that is a Library of Congress subject term, right? And you can and so there is um, a documentary that I got to see um, in Austin. And you know, end of July, beginning of August, and so um, it's not out accessible yet. But we do have a trailer, so I did I did want to play it for us. So you can, you know, it's just two minutes or so, so you can see how some of these metadata terms affect the cultures, right, that are being described. By So I haven't really looked at that word since probably like two, yeah, two years ago. I would say the majority of librarians don't think of undocumented immigrants as criminals, but I can see how looking at that subject heading, you would be persuaded to think that we do think that way, right? <laughs> that is the way in which you're cataloging knowledge on a global scale, according to that word, wow, right? This really shapes the ways that people continue to write about this subject, and it matters. And I catch myself like pinching myself whenever I get on an airplane. I, there's always this moment when I get to where they ask for your passport or your ID, where I just feel like they're gonna catch me. The communicative aspect of this becomes a really nice entry into this larger conversation, which is why is there so much anti-immigrant sentiment? I personally was done being quiet, not saying anything and expressing my voice. You know, that was very much the mentality that I had before coming to Dartmouth, because my parents were afraid as a consequence of our undocumented status. Back on Capitol Hill, Cruz, one of four Republican lawmakers, to sign a letter urging the Library of Congress not to eliminate the term. The uh, matter got so much media attention, it uh, sort of educated the public on what a subject heading like is, Negro. how library catalogs work. Because we understand that even words that start off as neutral descriptors can over time become used as verbal weapons and knives to inflict pain and disrespect and sow division.
or gives another lens of which to see these subjects, right? And, and it's a metadata field, and so um, the documentary, the filmmaker, I met with her, and so she's um, highly accessible, wants to kind of get the film out. So maybe, right, we'll work with Disc, and at some point we can get the film and provide some kind of like full showing. Um, but I'll just give away the ending <laughs> that they didn't change it, right? It didn't change. It didn't change. But these ideas of, okay, what is, you know, what do these terms look, what does it mean to the people who see themselves represented in these terms? And so um, I think that's important when we're thinking, you know, it's hard to think about those things when we're trying to get all the technical stuff and what is the class and the item title and the still image and the subject and but what's the creator the title and like all of those things are important in getting this up but these you know the subject the description there's especially when we're looking when we're dealing with these communities um, are important to think about and they came up organically earlier right from multiple people in here about hey what I'm looking for isn't coming up or it auto filled in right these other items and so um, I think at this point, maybe um, everyone has had a lot of um, questions about, oh, well, what about when we're trying to upload this item or what? And so maybe now is a good time to kind of maybe play with that field, with the subject field, and see what comes up. And maybe this is the way to start organizing a glossary of sorts, right? Some kind of shared. So, and then, we're, yeah. I was just going to say that maybe thinking about what are some of the other subject terms of you right and so that is something that I think maybe we can start doing now right even if you have to open up another browser yeah so while people are doing this um, I'd like to throw out the idea that um, this is really I think a call to action for us to flag to at least our funder that uh, communities can't self-represent if they don't have the terminology to uh, do that. And that's a big part of, I think, why I see this as a social justice project and why I see what we do as activism. So, you know, one way to sort of move forward, I think, to answer Patricia a little bit is like, let's form a little uh, task force or whatever to put this into our final report to Melon and something that we would like to follow up on um, in a phase two of this project would be addressing this issue. Like how are we supposed to do this if we're hitting this barrier? Um, I'm, I'm just like, I'm shocked by that trailer. Um, and I mean, it just seems so obvious when somebody points something, I, nobody else will be shocked. But when you see something so obvious that you need a change and then you don't like, come on. You know, and um, but then there's a lot of more subtle things like John was bringing up, or, or others have been bringing up. You know, of, so I think the, this is an important issue, right, for us to say this surfaced during our phase one, and we need to continue to do this work so that um, I, I feel it's it's really a human right that people be able to self-represent and communities be able to self-represent, and here we, we've just hit like a major roadblock. So. People are interested. Let me know. But um, Joanna, you know, people are interested, especially in language preservation, but also just more generally, like how can we communicate if we if they're not accepting the language that we use? And I think people have been developing workarounds, right? You you have ways to put other information on an item record, say in a catalog, that is searchable as a keyword. So sometimes that's a way that we've been able to myself working with Native American languages. That's also a big problem too. So, so I thought, you know, there's other rounds are great. I know and they're not the solution, <laughs> but I no. also feel like um, we're constantly adapting ourselves to them, yes, and that it's yeah. our sort of responsibility to ask them to adapt to us. I think that's a great idea for 
I'm just saying that, like, yeah, no, I mean, that's what that's that's how we roll. I mean, that's how we get along. So, um, I think people have gotten very creative in that, and that needs to definitely continue and be shared. But if the, I'm, I don't want to let them off the hook yet. Oh, no, no, I know, I hear you. Buffalo Soldiers. Mm -hmm. And there's quite a number of references. 
There's a whole page of them, but why couldn't they just put black yeah. buffalo and, soldiers and so that in? might also be, um, Portia said, okay, right, this, this plugin might be not pulling all of them, oh, right? And it's not, so, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, yes, uh, the, the uh, Black Lives Matter mm -hmm. comes up as Black Lives Matter movement time. Okay, well, there you go. I mean, I think that, yeah. that counts, right? Absolutely. Since this is open source, perhaps once a glossary has been created locally, yeah. a future project may be that a, an added widget to this would be able to pull everything, but more specifically look for uh, Chicano terms and terms that would be important for here. Maybe, yes. that's, maybe that's part yeah. of the... Perhaps that can, that can be one of the good sides of just being open source software that you can actually have something small built to do to make it to help your functionality. Right. Yes. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. So, any other questions on like the metadata fields in general that we talked about this morning, or you know, just thinking critically about the subject fields? Somebody want? Okay. So um, the afternoon portion was spent. I, I don't have the schedule in front of me, but I think the afternoon is um, we're walking around hands on digitizing and uploading materials, right? So. Okay. So to just to go back to some of the stuff that came up earlier. Um, on the lunch break, I investigated some diacritics, some accents, right? Um, and I have this handout. This is for this particular system on a PC. Okay, so if you have a Mac, I don't really know how you would do it. Fred is working <laughs> on a Mac in the back, and he had some success. Um, I guess the Mac makes it a little easier than the PC to enter care accented characters with the optical key. Does anyone, any other Mac users in the room know about that? Okay, so hopefully it'll be less of a problem for Mac users. And if, if a Mac user wants to come forward and create something like this for Mac users, I'll include both of these in the handbook. So um, I'll just get these started going around. Take one and pass it down. It'd be nice today, gonna be asking questions. Okay, so that's one item. Um, someone told me that links were not working in the handbook, which was the whole reason why I gave the digital copy in the first place. So I went ahead and uploaded the Microsoft Word version to that same folder. So if you re-download it to your desktop in Word, the links will then be clickable. I apologize for that. So frustrating. I wanted to thank you for all of your um, spread notes from the other day. Your oh, slide notes. Good. Okay. I'm glad that was helpful. Um, some people who did not receive the initial email about their account. It had, has everybody sorted out the the login for the Manitos site? Is anybody still having a, a problem logging into the site? You still are because you did not receive your email. Okay, okay. So what we found out that we can do about that is click this forgot password link on the login page, and it'll send you another email, hopefully. And don't forget to check your junk folder as well. Okay. It works. Um. Somebody said to me at some point. Uh, th th there was a question about digitizing cassettes. Is that a question that someone had? Yes. Yes? Someone did have a question about transferring cassettes to digital. Okay, well, uh, you did, that was you? Okay, so the short version is there's a little cassette player that you can purchase. They're about like 30 or $35. And it plugs into a USB port on your computer. And it comes with software. You basically just play the cassette through your computer sound card 
and it records it. So that's the quick and dirty answer to that question. Yes? How about uh, transferring data from an old floppy disk <laughs> to digital? So you need an old floppy drive. Right, yeah. 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 Oh, oh, oh. yeah. Definitely. Yeah. How do you prefer this resource? So you can buy them on eBay. Um, there are ones that will plug into a USB port, or if you know how to, like, un do your Is there a company, I mean, is there a service that you can go to, like, that? Like, um, maybe, maybe. So there's a company called Dubland here in Albuquerque, and they do a lot of digitizing of different formats. So you might be able to find someone who would do that for you. What's the name? It's called Dub, like yeah, Dub in video Dubland. I just wanted yes. to add, just to warn everybody regarding cassettes or reel to reels more, is that, and it's only because people might have older magnetic media and it's like the only recording of something which is magnetic media that's on tape tends to deteriorate and disintegrate so if it's a newer thing go ahead and do that but really if you're really worried about it magnetic media at this point that's old needs to be assessed because if you start playing it the magnetic particles are just going to come off as a project, what our level five is about trying to figure out in our next phase, hopefully, how to have a regional dead media transference thing, which would include taking care of things like that. I just want to say, be careful with really old magnetic media. So, That's so um, true. wanted to put that out there. Okay. So it might All be right. better to wait rather than do it yourself. Yeah, I would say. Err on the side of caution when it comes to anything that's magnetic particles on material, including floppy disks, actually, now that yeah. I think about it. So, okay. Uh, so, Portia raised this in regard to the plugins in the, in the subject field, right, that the, it's not providing a complete list of the Library of Cat Congress um, subject headings because we were able to find Cinco de Mayo, right? Um, and SAPS. Um, so this is the actual Library of Congress controlled vocabularies called authorities, right? And allows you to search more comprehensively. Um, whether you want to do that or not is up to you. But we just wanted to provide that as a resource, and I'll add that to the handbook as well. So you might want to re-download it like on Friday after I have time to make all these changes. Okay, and the most important thing, I realized I always do this, um, this morning when we were talking about um, creating our items, we need to talk about how you actually attach your file. So we're going to talk about that now, and then we're going to take a break. So I'll just go over this really quickly, and then um, during the workshop session, myself and our wonderful other Sarah, Margie, Alfred, sneaked out again. How did you know? Um, anyway, we'll be here to circulate and help people individually, and hopefully if you have other lingering problems, we can get those worked out. So, password. Okay. So. Here's my item, and I attached my butterfly at lunch. <laughs> but I want to show you how to do that. So when you're in the add item interface, right, with the list of fields that we spent time going over this morning, you're going to want to add media. That's the next tab. Values, those are your fields, your descriptive fields, right? The media is going to be your attachment. Now, my butterfly is here because I, because I added it, but if it wasn't, just get rid of it. It will be. So if you need to upload a, a file that you have on your computer, you're going to use the upload option and click on it. And you can give your file a title if you want to. It's not required. See, it doesn't have a, the red asterisk. And you can choose a file from your from your computer, right? You can navigate through your folders like you normally would, and add your file. Now, this is a little confusing to me. It just sits here. But when you click Save, 
It says not found. <laughs> no. I think that's because I, um, I think that, that I'm causing problems because I'm not attaching a photo, right? Mine's not. Actually, I'm attaching a photo, and there is no save button on that. It's so, a, oh, you know what? It's an ICO, so I'm not sure why it's a difference. But it, but I wish I could answer that. <laughs> Oh, my item isn't even there anymore. That's no, weird. you just because you deleted it. I did. I thought I clicked save. Well, that's very interesting. In any case, this is how you add a file. I'm just going to add a new item. Media, upload, and browse to your file. And if you, you know, I'm sure you've all seen and done this before, so it's just like, uploading it to Facebook or whatever. So Amy, is what you were recommending before create a spreadsheet? Like an ideal work workflow, all of your images would be in a spreadsheet and then you would just upload them one by one from the spreadsheet? Okay. So, so that's one way to do it, especially if you have a lot of items. Um, if you only have, let's say, five photos, you could have the photos in a folder and just create your metadata, just fill in the fields as you go. So the reason why we do the spreadsheet is because we're doing a, a number at a time. However, it is nice to have that because someone discovered over here that um, a lot of her metadata went missing. And we're not sure how that happened. We're not sure if someone edited her test item or we're not sure. So if you have a spreadsheet, you have a backup. So even if something happens and it would be a drag, you could still go in and re-add your item or fill out the description again if that was if just one field got deleted, right? So it's a good practice um, if you can handle kind of the added layer of extra work. And also if more than one person is working on a project like uh, an intern or a student mm -hmm. or whatever, uh, I think that's really nice. Yeah, and you can create, a, you don't need to have Excel, you could use uh, Google Sheets or some kind of shared application like that that multiple people could add to at the same time. Yes? And after this project is more developed in the future, keep in mind, that will become valuable to future generations. They will see they will see the story of the areas that were covered and when. So even that will end up serving as a historical historical document that will help in the narrative of telling the story. Yes. Amy, this presumes that one person is in charge of all of these photos from a community, but what in reality, there are a lot of people out there that have photos of people from a particular community. How do we involve them in order to add media and also the metadata spreadsheet? So, so, so yeah. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, well, this is one of the reasons why I built into the structure of this project was working with community-based organizations. So. Mainly libraries, but also uh, nonprofit organizations. Sometimes there isn't a library, or sometimes the nonprofit organization is just more active for whatever reason. So that there is um, uh, not everybody is going to want to become and you know have a password and do that whole thing, right? So so that is built into this process. Is that there would be either events in the community or times at the library where people can bring in help get help with scanning, get help with metadata, get help so that um, they do feel like they can participate and then people who want to just do this, you know, as individuals can, can be, uh, you know, given a password so that they get in. But that shouldn't be um, a requirement to contribute, right? So, um, and that's another reason why we have built in the idea of youth youth historians because um, if, if people need help then we have people who are, you know, could be there to uh, assist them who's not the librarian who's also going to find other things and whatnot. So that would be up to each community how they, what works best for them. Um, this, the, 
Story Box kit is a, a tool kit for holding events where people would come, you know, together at, at, at an event, but other libraries have already said, well, we could do, you know, two hours a week. Because otherwise people are going to be coming in all the time, here's my box of 500 family photos, right? But if you have a time set aside where they know they can come and, and people will be there to help them. So that's part of it. I don't know if you have a different answer. No, I think that's great. So I'm going to encourage you to take a break, right? Get a walk around, go to the bathroom, whatever. I'm going to go do that myself. And then um, we'll be workshopping. So if you have problems, put up your hand.